On today's Locked on Jayhawks, LeBaron Phylon, top five point guard in the class, is decommitting from Kansas, asking for his letter of release, what it means for KU's offseason. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Find me on Twitter at D Johnson Radio. You can give us a follow here with the show anywhere you get your podcasts with Locked On Jayhawks, and find us on YouTube where you can like and subscribe to the show. If you're on a pad- podcast platform that allows you to give us a five star view, give us one if you could. It very helps us out on our end of things. LeBaron Phylon has requested his release from his national letter of intent with Kansas. And we're going to be breaking that down on today's edition of the show, what it means, what KU is losing out on Phylon, how it affects Kansas for the rest of the offseason, how it affects their team in 2024 to 2025, and the effect on who's going to be the future point guard one for Kansas. We discuss all that on today's episode of the show, which is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side. And it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play Store today. All right, so we're going to start with uh, what Candace is kind of losing here with LeBaron Phylon. And thank you to the Everdayers tuning into each and every episode. Don't forget we had uh, an episode come out that uh, uh, talked about, you know, Kobe Brea. And I think that'll circle around into this one coming up here. Uh, in a little bit, but Phylon, who is he? He is a four-star point guard in the class of 2024. So he was going to join as an incoming freshman uh, this off season. He was a six foot four guard. He's listed as a point guard, but if you want to call him a combo guard, whatever, uh, originally from Branson, Missouri, basically everywhere you look, he's somewhere in that like 26 to 33 range in recruiting to so basically top 35 recruit in the country. And on 20, 20- 7 sports and the 24 7 sports composite he was the number three point guard in the class it was a very big deal when they landed him as it should be and as it will be for the next school that ends up landing LeBaron Phylon it is a big deal he is one of the better recruits in the country here's the scouting report according to on three he uh quick on quick lead guard he has long arms and a projectable frame with wide shoulders Phylon has a quick handle that gets him into the paint he can knock down a jump shot with three-point range and consistency. There's confidence and competitiveness with Phylon. He needs to add strength as he has a slight frame. There's upside on the defensive end. He can move his feet guarding the ball and is quick to get into the passing lanes. There's a natural smoothness he has on the ball with an upside to continue getting better. Now, we saw this happen last year, that in today's day and age with the transfer portal, like from his perspective, you can understand it. Obviously, there's a chance that – you know, he could come into Kansas right away and beat out on Marco Jackson, or maybe he is just that talented and and that good. And, and he's even ahead of a guy like Zeke Mayo or something um, in terms of what you're talking about in the pecking order. Like there's a chance that you could do all that, but I don't know. The odds are going to be a little bit against it there. And there's also a chance that you don't beat out Zeke Mayo, that you don't beat out El Marco Jackson, who for what it's worth, El Marco was ranked higher as a recruit then LeBaron Phylon is, and now has a year in the system, uh, unlike him. Now, every recruiting class is made different and everything, but point being, there would be a chance that LeBaron Phylon goes to Kansas and he gets buried on the depth chart. and He doesn't play much in year one, which I know we love the kids who stay and develop, and, and I still do think there is uh, a soft spot in my heart and many people's hearts for the kids who are willing to say, you know what, screw it, I'm going to compete, I'm going to deal with it. I'm not going to chastise a kid. I'm not going to hold it against a kid for thinking the opposite. I'm just going to hold up a kid who wants to do that. And so if he wants to go, you totally get it because, yeah, you could be buried in year one. And in a world where the transfer portal, as much as it has led to freedom for players, it's also led to freedom for coaches to basically be like, hey, if you're not as good as I think you are, even early on, I'm not going to be patient about it. I'm just going to go bring in this transfer portal kid who we know has done it at the D1 level. And you're going to constantly be over recruited to where if you don't get playing time in year one, it's not like it was, you know, 15 years ago, where it's like, oh, if you don't get playing time in year one, you'll probably get some playing time in year two. By year three, you might be a starter. By year four, you might be an All American. No, it's like now, well, you'll just get recruited over in the transfer portal if you don't perform in year one and then you may never hit the court and then you're gonna have to transfer anyway so um it it is an unfortunate loss because i had heard good things about lebaron phylon's leadership ability and i was excited for his future at kansas 
this is just kind of how things go now, as we saw last year when Kansas was ultra aggressive in the transfer portal, and it led to Chris Johnson. It led to Marcus Adams, although I don't know, maybe it didn't lead as much to Marcus Adams. That might have been other stuff kind of going on. Uh, but anyway, led to some freshmen you had leaving without end up actually playing for you at Kansas. Now, I do think the one difference here, though, while you look up and Marcus Adams has transferred whatever it's been like four times at this point, three times at this point, and Chris Johnson didn't really play for Texas this past year and, and now had to transfer down a little bit. While you look back at those and, and you're not overly spurned with what kind of happened there, this is one of those where I could see LeBaron Phylon going to whatever school and, you know, in a couple of years you look back and you're like, oh, man, that would have been cool to have him in a Kansas uniform. But that said, it does equip Kansas and it does equip Spring Bill with another bit of artillery because they have another scholarship to work with now, possibly. Let's discuss how this affects the KU offseason, how this affects the 2024 to 2025 Kansas Jayhawks, and how this affects the future of the point guard starting position under Bill Self at Kansas and in Lawrence. First, we're going to take a quick time out on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. This episode of the show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It is playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your number one place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs, slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. And they even have their Tuesdays, speaking of home runs, uh, Dinger Tuesdays, where you can put a minimum of a $25 bet on somebody to hit a home run. And whether you get the home run bet or not, which it's great if you do, you're getting a $5 bonus bet back. There, there's certain limitations on it and everything for every home run that's hit in the game by everybody. So like, you know, they, they have all sorts of great promos just like that with FanDuel. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, so how does this affect the KU offseason now? Because as much as I was excited for LeBaron Phylon, it, it felt like this was a distinct possibility from the word go that, yeah, you have Dewan Harris and you have Zeke Mayo and Riley Kugel and, you know, Marco Jackson, guys that could possibly be ahead of you. Who knows? Maybe Jamari McDowell takes a big step in, in year two. Uh, if they're going to end up adding Ryland Griffin, that's another player who could be playing, you know, some minutes at the two because you figured Phylon would have played his minutes at the one and the two. So you're talking about, you know, how does this affect KU this offseason? How does this affect KU this season? Well, let's start with the offseason. This, first of all, means Kansas has another scholarship to play with. And as we did our Kobe Brea deep dive earlier this week, Kobe Brea, this, please check out that episode if you missed it, 49% three-point shooter at Dayton. And, and it's, it's not just about Kobe Brea. It's about adding anybody else, really, because if you're under the assumption that Kansas is going to land Ryland Griffin, which – Seems to be a lot of people expecting that. But again, recruiting is weird and you never know what happens till the very last minute. So whatever. But regardless of what you think is going to happen there, you know, Kansas does not have a ton of scholarships open uh, to a point where, you know, after or, or before LeBaron Phylon left, Kansas had, I guess you would say, 12 scholarship players. A 13th would be either Rylan Griffin or Johnny Furphy coming back from the NBA, from right, because Dewan Harris, Riley Kugel, A.J. Store, Hunter Dickinson, Marco Jackson, Zeke Mayo, Rakeese Passmore, K.J. Adams, Floyd Badunga, Jamar McDowell, Zach Clements. That's 11 right there, right? So Griffin would be 12. When you had Phylon, I guess that was your 13th if you had Furphy back, right? So point being, you don't have a lot of work, room to work with with a number of scholarships to bring on other players. And sometimes this stuff just works itself out to where now you can say, okay, well, without LeBaron Phylon, you know, that leaves Kansas, if Johnny Furphy stays in the NBA draft, that would leave Kansas with 11 scholarship players. Let's say you land Ryland Griffin on Friday. That would give you 12 scholarship players. You could be done there, but as we know, due to the NCAA stuff, they have to give up a scholarship, but that could be this year or that could be next year. And so they could say, hey, we still have a scholarship open. Do we just leave it there in case Furphy wants to come back? Or do we go out and get a Kobe Brea? Do we go out and get a, a Max Shunga or, or one of these other players who's available in the transfer portal, a Javon Small, something like that, right? Those are entirely possible, and now they are possible because this happened. 
Uh, for all we know, behind closed doors, I mean, that becomes kind of interesting that we probably won't find out. Was this more of a LeBaron Phylon decision? Was this more of a Bill Self decision? Was this more of a Bill Self decision to say, hey, we want to get the more win guy now, and, and I don't know how much you're going to play. I'm just going to be honest with you. If you want to stick through it, then I'll be happy to have you, but um, I'll help you out if you want to find a new school. Or was this more from the LeBaron Phylon camp where it was just, hey, we just want to find somewhere with with more playing time? I'm assuming it's more of the latter if if I'm picking one, but again, that is just kind of a complete guess. But yeah, now Kansas does have a scholarship to get more creative with, and it doesn't even mean that they have to use it. Because again, if you had Rylan Griffin on Friday, you'd be at 12 and you could just say, hey, we're contemplating 12 and we'll just leave the 13th open in the case that Johnny Furphy does decide to come back from the NBA, which um, I don't know, that might not be the overwhelming consensus right now uh, obviously it also means now that there's there's less competition i guess or maybe more minutes available although again if he was going to be behind all these other guys i don't know how many more minutes but less competition for guys like El marco jackson and zeke mayo and riley kugel and jamari mcdowell probably has a bigger impact on like mcdowell and El marco in terms of that playing time and the role on the team and everything, but it could have a, a uh, an impact on Zeke Mayo and Riley Google to the standpoint of like, you know, maybe if LeBaron Phylon was going to play 10 minutes a game, now that 10 minutes is gone, could all of that just go to the next guy to fill in? Could that go to Marco Jackson? Could it go to Jamar McDowell? Or would those minutes just get divvied out? And then here's an extra three minutes for Zeke Mayo. Here's an extra three minutes for Riley Kugel and an extra four minutes for Marco Jack. Who knows, right? But it does kind of lighten that up at least a little bit, at least until, again, if there's another guard that kind of gets added on. Because going back to that first part, if they do use the scholarship to land someone good who's actually better right now than what LeBaron Phylon would be, whereas Phylon might be better long term, then it actually could lead to the opposite. It could lead to less minutes to play right away for some of these guys and even more competition. So it is funny how quickly those things can kind of turn on a dime. Uh, KU also has now one less possible point guard, but it's not something where it's like, okay, now you have to recruit a point guard in the portal. Now, maybe they would, right? Maybe there are some players out there who you would say, hey, um, I'm, I'm interested in bringing you on. We, we maybe have some minutes in the backcourt, right? I know John L. Davis is still out there, but I, I don't know how likely that one would, would kind of be. Uh, maybe a Javon Small, who was at Oklahoma State last year. Um, I don't know. Max Sholga is kind of a combo guard. Primo Spears, if you're looking for, for maybe a bench guard. Jaden Stone, Jalen Leach, Leland Walker, guys who could maybe play a smaller role and just give you another body there at the, the, the guard position that are uh, still available out there. But you should be fine if you don't want to do that. If you're just like, hey, let's bring on Rylan Griffin and Kobe Brea and just bring on wings because Dewan Harris, we know, is going to play a lot of minutes at the point. Zeke Mayo can play point guard and uh, Marco Jackson can play some point guard. And it's like in a pinch, if you had to play. I guess, like, uh, I don't know, a lineup where Jamari McDowell was your fourth point guard where he had to come in th for three minutes because somebody was in foul trouble. Like, would that be the end of the world if he's surrounded with a bunch of talent? No, probably not. So, yeah, I, th I think they would be fine there. Now, it is hard to say how this affects KU's level of play and how this affects how good they are or, you know, what level can they get to for this upcoming 2024 to 2025 season because you don't exactly know what you're getting from a freshman and yeah you you never really know what you're getting with any new player right like as, as much as I think AJ Store is going to come in hit the ground running and be this awesome scorer for KU sure there's a chance that he comes in and right like Remy Martin perfect example like multiple time like all Pac-12 performer averaging like 20 points per game at Arizona State and yes at the end he was this dominant player and, and there were flashes at the beginning. Like you think of the champions classic game where he scores like 15 off the bench. And I think it was the, uh, it was Tarleton state or Stephen F. Austin. I don't know. Somebody that they played that um, they had to kind of win close late and he came up with some big shots. There were moments, but it wasn't an, an automatic translation, right? So there, there always is questions about when you have something new, how it's going to translate, but that is even magnified when it becomes a freshman, because how many freshmen do we see come in that um, end up being way better than their recruiting ranking? And how many freshmen do we end up seeing who end up being, you know, uh, players who don't really even play in year one, right? I mean, you think of like Grady Dick, for instance, like he was ranked in the low teens, but uh, based on his performance, like he was basically like a top 10 recruit for my money. I mean, he was like the Gatorade National Player of the Year. So if you're just talking about impact in college, which I know the recruiting rankings, a lot of them are based on career. So they are factoring in, you know, where's your ultimate potential in the NBA and everything, which is not going to be as applicable to the college game. But if you were just ranking recruits for, I, I think that'd be interesting. I would love for there to be a recruiting website where it just ranks recruits based on their college game. 
because I, I think that would be a different way of looking at things. That would be kind of a nice uh, between the two that you could look at. Because again, Grady Dick, from that standpoint, especially if you're talking about hitting the ground running in college, probably would have been a top five recruit in the country from, from the college perspective. Now he was still like a lottery pick, right? So it's not like he would have been that much further. But like point being, you have other guys where like, I remember, I think it was like, I don't know, like Tyrese Halliburton or something like that for Iowa State. I forget if he was a one and done or a two and done, but like he hit the ground running right away for Iowa State. He was ranked in like the 40s or 50s or something like that. And clearly he was better than that. Um, I guess he turned into an NBA star too. So maybe that was one that was just wrong overall. But I don't know. I, I guess you don't really know is the point I'm trying to make here, what you're going to get from LeBaron Phylon. And so it, it's hard to say what exactly you're missing out on. It could be something where if he hits the ground running right away and you know, let's say he goes to another power five school and he averages 12 points, four assists per game. And he's shooting, you know, 34% from three and he's a solid defender and a good athlete and everything. You're going to be looking up there going, man, you missed out on something there. And and maybe that would have been better than what you're getting from a couple of your guards. But there's also a chance that, because we've seen it before with, with so many freshmen and think about just some of the recent classes where guys were unable to crack the rotation or were really able to establish being players on the team. And that, that could have happened to LeBaron Phylon too. And if that's what was going to happen this year, then you're not really missing much out of this. So yes, there's a chance he beats out on Marco Jackson and was super talented and played 15 to 20 minutes a game. There's also a chance he was buried on the depth chart and wasn't really a part of that rotation. Um, now, I will say, um, I don't know. I it's hard to, it's easy to, with the known commodity that Marco struggled last year to say, hey, the new thing with LeBaron Phylon is going to automatically be better. But like I said, Marco Jackson was ranked higher in recruiting rankings than LeBaron Phylon. And he has a year of Bill Self under his belt. Now, different styles, different types of players and every recruiting class is made differently. But yeah, there's no guarantee how it would have hurt. So it's hard to say this will hurt KU for this season because what if they use the scholarship to get a, a player who's more uh, win now, you know? Uh, but it's also hard to say that this helps them either because what if you do use that scholarship on somebody else or what if you don't use it at all and what if Phylon ends up being really good at his next stop? But one thing that this does have a real big effect on is who's going to be the starting point guard once Dewan Harris graduates. Let's talk about that on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Scoreboard's not looking good. You're feeling low. Not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists and take as much of your friend's money as possible. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. Play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. Make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. Change other players' rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go. Now free on the App Store or Google Play Store today. This episode of Locked on Jayhawks is also brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Awesome features. Like easy to find and buy MLB tickets for every kind of event in your area. They have the lowest price guarantee. The game time mean that means game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on college, L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E, all one word, for $20 off. Download game time today. Low. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Finishing things up, how does this affect KU's future at the point guard position? So this next season, don't really have to worry about that as much, right? As we talked about earlier, lots of options. Dewan Harris can play point. Zeke Mayo can play point. Um, Marco Jackson can play point, right? You, you certainly have uh, all the options there. But what about after the season? Because Zeke Mayo will graduate. Dewan Harris will graduate. Well, it'd be easy to say if if a Marco Jackson, you know, performs well this season, that he would be the guy at the point guard position. 
Um, but what if a Marco Jackson does the same thing, looks like the same guy he was this past season? How confident are you going to be that that would be your starting point guard? You wouldn't be at that point. Now, you are hoping for that big jump this year. Obviously, we just had a, an episode on Monday talking about the Darius Acuff Jr. visit, and he's the number one point guard in the class. If you land him, you feel like, okay, that's that's probably the guy. And maybe it's El Marco and him starting together, or maybe it's just him starting, right? Um, but But I think it gives you one less option is kind of the point here. One less possibility of something happening. One less where, you know, right now it was like, okay, maybe it would be El Marco, maybe it'd be LeBaron Phylon, whoever wins out on that competition. Maybe it'll be a guy like Acuff. Maybe it'll be a transfer portal pickup. You just have lots of options. And and you still do have lots of options, but it's one less option with LeBaron Phylon, who was somebody who, you know, I, I thought could be a player for this team kind of long-term. But I'll say this. El Marco Jackson has a real chance this season to establish himself as the go-to point guard for 2025 to 2026 six come his junior season like this year for El Marco is huge because if he, if like I said if he is kind of the same guy maybe he ends up transferring at the end of the year or maybe he's over recruited or something maybe KU goes in the transfer portal in addition to whatever they do from the high school ranks but if El Marco looks good right and, and that might not even be in a in a gigantic role like El Marco could look really good in a 15 to 20 minute per game role this year but we see it all the time like uh, this is going to be taking it to the extreme but you'll understand what I'm saying because it's happened so many times at Kansas, especially in the earlier days. You think like Thomas Robinson, the the years he was behind the Morris twins where, yeah, maybe he's not playing 30 minutes a game. He's not playing 25 minutes a game, but in the stretches he's out there, you're like, this kid's going to be really good when he gets the bigger role. You know, it was the, kind of the case for Zach Eady when he was at Purdue behind, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of their other big man they had? I, don't, I almost wanted to say Caleb Swan again, but it's not. Anyway, um, they had that. Or like Cole Aldridge, when he's playing a much smaller role behind, you know, Darnell Jackson and Sasha Khan and, and all these big men that KU had where he's basically the fifth big man. But it was like you saw it in the flashes where it was like, this kid's going to be good. That's what you're going to be looking for from a Marco this year. Because when you have Dewan and Zeke Mayo and Riley Kugel and, and all these guys, you know, he might only play 15 to 20 minutes per game. But if he looks really good in doing it, you're going to go into that next season being like, yeah, we feel good that he's our guy or that he can start next to if you bring in a transfer guy or a cuff or, or one of these other guys. But if he doesn't look good, then, yeah, you're probably looking at new blood there at the point guard position where it wouldn't be somebody returning, which could be a little bit scary for uh, Kansas where, you know, Bill Self does well with, I guess, trusted experience in his system, especially at that point guard spot. Uh, that'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. You can find our show anywhere you get your podcast, including on our YouTube page. We'll be back to uh, do some more LOJ. We have a football episode coming out. We got Football Friday coming out, and uh, maybe we'll have some Ryland Griffin news at some point later this week. That'll do it for this episode. See you next time. 